plans, not practical proposals and blueprints, however radical they might be. Libertarians love to discuss every detail of how to privatize this or that and whether there will be copyrights in the free society or not. Against this impulse to be practical, I will make use of the critique of praxis by the German neo-Marxist sociologist Theodor W. Adorno. Adorno's main point is that being practical implies to surrender oneself to the powers that be. With many practical examples, I will show how right Adorno is and how important it is for the sake of libertarian theory to incorporate his insights. First, some words about Theodor W. Adorno. Theodor W. Adorno lived from September 12, 1903 to August 6, 1979. He was the son of Oskar Wiesenbund, a successful Jewish wine merchant, and Maria Cavelli Adorno, a Catholic, Catholic of Corsican descent. Maria Cavelli Adorno was a professional singer who performed with her sister, a pianist. Theodor W. Adorno was, is intellectually renowned as a German critical sociologist, philosopher, pianist, musicologist, and composer. He was a member of the so-called Frankfurt School of Social Research, along with Max Horkheimer, Walter Benjamin, Robert Marcuse, Jürgen Habermas, and others. For those who take an interest in German literature, it is noteworthy that Adorno assisted the writer Thomas Mann, who used Adorno's expertise in modern music for his novel Dr. Faustus, published in 1947. Despite his broad cultural and scientific interests, Theodor W. Adorno was from the beginning primarily a philosophical thinker. The later social philosopher emphasizes a critical aspect of his philosophical thinking, which from the late 1950s onwards took an intellectually prominent position in the forming of the international youth protest now labeled as the 60s movement. Adorno studied in Frankfurt on the Main, Germany, and would have become a professor there, but in 1933 the Nazis revoked his teaching allowance because of him being a Jew. After a short period in Oxford, England, he emigrated to the USA. Adorno considered himself to be a Marxist, but only people who did not like to differentiate would ask why he didn't choose the Soviet Union to emigrate to. The group Adorno belonged to considered the Soviet Union and especially Stalinism not as a fulfillment, but as a distraction of Marxism. Next to Karl Marx, the biggest intellectual influence on Adorno had been the psychoanalysis of Sigmund Freud. From 1949 on, Adorno was a professor in Frankfurt on the Main, and in the 60s he was the most outspoken challenger of both Sir Karl Popper's philosophy of science and Martin Heidegger's philosophy of existence. Also, Adorno was, as a Marxist, seen as a herald of left-wing youth protest movement in the 60s. He did not like much of what he saw, like disregard of the cultural heritage, new conformism, and a kind of politics that uses all the abhorred instruments of statism, group pressure, 
blackmail and outright violence. The central question of Adorno's theory has been how did reason, enlightenment, humanism, liberalism and socialism result in today's horrors? The Dialectic of Enlightenment, as his most popular book written in 1944 in collaboration with Max Horkheimer is called, begins with the following thought. Adorno understood enlightenment in the widest possible sense as an advance of thought. According to Adorno, enlightenment has always aimed at liberating human beings from fear and installing them as masters. But the result of enlightenment is that the wholly enlightened earth is occupied by disaster and inhumanity. To give you an outline of Adorno's, of Adorno's answer, I go through aphorism number 110 in his book Minima Moralia, written in 1943 and 1947. Everywhere I, uh, everywhere, uh, everywhere our normal middle class society insists that we control ourselves by will. Control our, our emotions, our needs and our movements. There is only one exception. Love. Love is supposed to be spontaneous. In love we are allowed to lose control. Instead of the will, feelings should rule love. But our whole life is ruled by instrumental reason. The clock invites us to remind us to rush to work. Our days, weeks, months, years of life are preoccupied by dates, contracts, promises to be held, by being reasonable, moderate, future-looking, and so forth. How can we be spontaneous, authentic, emotional, and passionate within the, the time slot reserved for love and, more explicitly, sex? Tons of books and magazine articles written by advisors and therapists say how to achieve this, be it candlelight dinners or watching porn movies together to get a clue how to move. But nothing works. The longing for spontaneous and sensible love means, according to Adorno, the liberation from the rational order of our daily lives, especially from the routine of work. Thus the idea of love transcends our normal rational society. In that way, the idea of love is a picture of a better world. Because the world of love and the world of reason are mutually exclusive, the idea of love is not a peaceful enclave, but conscious resistance. This, of course, has been the idea of the hippies as well as of today's reason critics, those who preach the return to spontaneity and emotion. But what would you, for instance, think of the idea that I do not show up to give this lecture because I prefer to stroll around the city in order to enjoy nature or to engage in spontaneous sex? <laughs> and at the moment, the political forces that are directed against enlightenment and reason do not even pretend to aim at liberating mankind, but at enslaving it again to some sort of irrational religious rules. Yet Adorno does not stop here. His very special kind of dialectics starts from this point. 
Conscious resistance requires planning and self-control. Just those things that the idea of love wants to overcome. But according to Adorno, the test of the feelings is whether they last. Real feelings last longer than the moment in which they are felt. Fidelity, as demanded by society, on the one hand, as a means of unfreedom, but there is another side. Fidelity also is resistance against the demand of society, because by ex accepting love from the demand of self-control, society robs its power to realize a better world. This is what Adorno means by this phrase that was famous in the 1960s. There is no right live like there is no right life in the wrong one. Another translation of the same phrase reads wrong life cannot be lived rightly. That is you cannot jump from the unfree society to some sort of better society, you cannot even envision how the better society, practically speaking, would or should look alike. Now I came to some problems in the libertarian utopia. Is it possible to envision a modern stateless society? This might sound like a question of a stout statist, but I will twist it around and use it to enlighten the libertarian theory. Again, is it possible to envision a modern stateless society? Of course, there are some libertarian utopias. The theorist of conservative anarcho-capitalism, Hans Hermann Hoppe, for instance, envisions that people who are free of status oppression will live in relatively homogeneous ethnic communities. Confronted with the argument that people might as well want to live in ethnic mixed communities, he instantly admits that that might be possible but will not be likely to come about. The founder of anarcho-communism, Peter Krokotki, thought that a stateless free society would not need formally defined property rights. People would organize everything on the basis of free association and free contract. Ask how you can, for instance, make a contract for delivering a pair of shoes when you cannot be sure that nobody else takes the shoes away beforehand, an act of communists will answer, in the stateless society nobody will commit such an act of greed. <laughs> Some libertarians cannot conceive that in a stateless society there will be such a thing as patents or copyrights. I have no idea about patents, but being an author, I ask myself how to make a living in a world without copyrights. Probably I should think twice of being a libertarian. <laughs> Practically speaking, people are right to ask how they could trust it, that a libertarian change in society would have any positive impact if libertarians cannot come to a united position to even such a marginal question as copyrights. Marginal to most of the people, not to me. But our position gets in no way clearer if we turn to questions of everyday politics or less radical changes. I remember that in the mid-1980s, Leon Lowe, of South Africa told the following story. He was a consultant to a homeland. 
The racist South African government had founded homelands to take some pressure out of the ethnic conflict. In the homelands, black people enjoy a great deal of autonomy, but the homelands were, of course, located in economically non-developed areas. Dion tried to help a homeland, I don't remember which one it has been, to develop its economy. And he learned how difficult it is to put libertarianism to practice. To repeal the monopoly protection of taxi drivers, for instance, looked like an uncomplicated measure. In reality, it became a very complicated thing to repeal the monopoly protection of taxi drivers. If anyone can enter the taxi driver market because there is no more licensing, the income of existing taxi drivers will be lowered, Otherwise, it would have been no monopoly trend. Lowering the income, not of wealthy, but of already relatively poor people, poses a real social problem. Oliver Hartwig of the London-based think tank Policy Exchange told me about the difficulty to deregulate the British housing market. Simply to repeal the zoning laws would mean that real estate prices would go down. Very good for the poor, but very bad for the middle class who, by heroic efforts, managed to build houses despite the regulations. Repealing the zoning laws would result in political chaos and produce an atmosphere not favorable to further libertarian proposals. You might answer that these examples address only the questions of transition. But what would be the practical use of a blueprint of the stateless society if there were no way to bring it about? The transition problem would not become easier if we move back to more fundamental questions concerning infrastructure, justice, or defense policies. Either we must conclude that libertarianism is theoretically speaking inconsistent and cannot, practically speaking, become a reality, or we must offer, offer some explanations how our plight comes about. And I think I can provide, with the help of Theodore W. Adorno's theory, some ideas to explain why it is so difficult to put libertarianism to practice. First, I want to explain Adorno's category of totality. Totality, as used by Adorno, means the whole situation determ determines or forms the individual's thinking and acting. This statement, the statement, the whole situation determines or forms the individual thinking and acting, this statement might sound strange and even anti-libertarian in many years because we stress individualism and the individual's capacity to act responsibly. But Adorno does not mean that totality is a desirable thing. It's just real. And Adorno finds it to be a pity. German philosophy today charges Adorno to be an extreme individualist. In this respect, it is important to note that Adorno traces anti-Semitism to the urge for equality, among others. Liberalism advocated rights of men and allowed the Jews' property Yet the harmony of society turned against the liberal Jews because the harmony of society assumed the shape of the harmony of a national community. When the German masses accepted the reactionary ticket of national socialism, 
that contain anti-Semitic components, they obeyed, according to Adorno, a social mechanism in which individual relationships between Jews and non-Jews played no part. It has in fact been found out that anti-Semitism has as much a chance in areas where there are literally no Jews as it does in those where there are Jews. Individual freedom and individual responsibility are, according to Adorno, the aim. But they are not the reality. To all those libertarians who abhor the sociologist concept of the individual formed by social forces, and who insist that individuals are at this moment and at every moment free to act responsible, I answer, in that case, it wouldn't be possible to criticize any political or social situ situation. If everyone acts to the best of his or her wits and is free to do so, the result must be the best of all possible worlds. But I decided to become a writer thinking that there is and will be a copyright. The taxi drivers in the mentioned homeland and everywhere in the world decide to become taxi drivers counting on the monopoly protection by licensing. The homeowners in London bought real estate because they had been sure that the zoning laws are here to stay. We all decide to the best of our wits under whatever situation is given. But the situation is wrong, as Adorno would phrase it. And therefore, our decisions become wrong as well. This is one aspect of what Adorno meant by his famous saying I already mentioned. There is no right life in the wrong one. This argument is by no way alien to libertarian theory, yet not thought through to the radical end. Maury Rothbard, for instance, said in his remarkable study of America's Great Depression that a cluster of errors in economic decisions made by individuals indicate that there are certain external infringements that cause that errors. With other words, if there is a cluster of economic errors, the false decision of an individual person will not be personally, but socially caused. As possible social causes, Rothbard named inflation, taxation, and tariffs, among others. The crucial thing to understand is that these causes are not directly felt by most of the participants of economic life. The individual thinks he makes a personal decision and if he, if he loses money, he feels that he just made a miscalculation. In reality, the decision was manipulated. For instance, credit expansion gave the false information that there is real capital to invest at hand. The individual had calculated correctly if only the information had been reliable. Thus, libertarian economics trace back individual miscalculations to their social origins. Such a kind of argument is necessary if we do not want to deduce from economic depressions that people tend to make wrong economic decisions and that therefore the market does not function well. Here we face a logical either-or situation. The depression is either the fault of a cluster of false decisions of private individuals or as it must be explained by some socio-economic factors beyond 
the responsibility of acting individuals. If you insist in explaining a depression by false individual decisions, you will inevitably come to the conclusion that the free market of private decisions does not result in the best economic effects. Rothbard's economic explanation of depressions and business cycles is a good example of what Adorno meant by totality. The, diabol the diabolical dialectics of totality, as Adorno conceives the term, is that every individual striving for happiness and well-being is turned into an instrument to embody the individual into totality. If you want to fight inflation by not making use of paper money, you will face severe economic problems. If you fight the state by not paying taxes, you will go to prison. No, you could not even buy something to eat because of the taxes included in every product. If you walk on the streets, you walk on infrastructure built, maintained and regulated by the state. Even if you breathe, you breathe air claimed by the state as something that it can regulate. I remember an ironic statement Tiba Makan made about the late Sarkonkin III at one of the first libertarian conferences I attended in the beginning of the 1980s. Tibor said that Sam wrote him a letter in which Sam accused Tibor of making of being a statist. Wrote him a letter today, it's long ago. Today he would uh, email it. But then he wrote a letter. Um, Sam wrote Tibor a letter accusing Tibor of being a statist because as a professor he uses state money. And he sent us a letter by the post office! <laughs> Tibor shouted. <laughs> Tibor was right in that it was wrong of Sam to make it a moral question not to use any of the state's resources because if you try to live up to that moral standard you cannot send a letter in a country which grants a monopoly on postal service and as I stated you cannot even breathe you have no other choice than to die but Tiber was wrong to use this plight as an argument against radical libertarians. Because you cannot act and think consistently unless you submit to the powers that be. Now, if thinking is a specific type of action, can it be at all possible, according to the concept of totality, to criticize the powers that be. This is a good question. Even radical criticism is, I don't know, states limited. Our thinking is coined by the existing state of things. Therefore, everything that we envision as a brighter future is by definition spoiled by its conformism. And this is what we experience in libertarianism as well. All the difficulties we face in our lives today are projected into the future. And we are trying to think of a better way to cope with them, be it copyrights, be it water shortages in the third world, be it finding security against terrorism without injuring non-combatants. If you take a close look, we quarrel about these questions and the supposed solutions in exactly the same way as politicians quarrel about everything. Every libertarian thinker tries to get accepted 
as it wants to interpret libertarianism the right way. According to Adorno, criticism can only be true if it stays strictly negative. We can feel that the existing state of things does us wrong. Our bodies tell us. The oppressed nature rebels against the existing state of things. This is a tiny little hole in totality. The opposition between praxis or action and thinking, which Adorno saw, can be illustrated, for instance, by his criticism of the youth rebellion in the 1960s. The following thoughts are taken from one of his latest essays called Resignation. In this context, Adorno even criticized Karl Marx. Marx made a mocking statement about the critical critic, the critical critic, which is not able to bring about real changes in the real world. But Adorno says that this statement aimed at silencing critic altogether. You are allowed to think only such thoughts which are realistic and which lead to social action. Yet if you stay in the realm of realism and of practical actions, you only can react to those challenges which society inflicts upon you. You are reacting, not acting. This, of course, leads to the wrong results. Only thinking could find an exit. Adorno writes, and moreover, a thinking whose results are not determined beforehand, as is so often the case in political discussions, in which it is already settled who should be right. Such, dis discussions, such discussions, therefore, do not advance the cause, but rather degenerate into male tactics. This is not only true about the left-wing protest movement of the 60s, but of all political movements. <coughs> Thoughts other than those that are practical are mocked off. But being practical means to resign oneself to the existing conditions. Or, to take up the phrase of the headline of my speech, su suggested by uh, Christian with the devil. Only those who face the despair of negativity forced on, on us by totality do not sit down to have supper with the devil. They have not given up hope of redemption. So I end my lecture with one of Adorno's most beautiful thoughts, again taken from the great Minima Moralia. If you want to practice philosophy responsibly, in the face of despair, your only chance is to take up the standpoint of redemption. From the standpoint of redemption, you can look upon things differently. It is redemption that gives knowledge, insights and cognition, light to shine upon the world. If knowledge, insights and cognition don't take up the standpoint of redemption, they are only reconstruction of the existing and their techniques. Thank you.